Warning, the review you are about to watch will contain spoilers wherever necessary for educational or entertaining purposes. Click away now if you don't wish to be spoiled. Hello friends, I'm the Dyslexic Cosplayer, and it's time we talk about Blake 7 once again! You cannot believe how excited I am to finally be getting back to reviewing after, well, let's just say some unfortunate setbacks. Between my mental health and my computer dying, yeah, that was a problem. But at any rate, let's get into the facts surrounding Blake 7. Blake 7 was created by Terry Nation, the man famous for creating the Daleks over on Doctor Who. He was basically pitching script ideas to the BBC for various shows, and none of them were landing. So with his back to the wall, pulled the idea of Blake 7 completely out of thin air. Terry's plan was to write all 13 of the original episodes, but seeing as that didn't go so well, he got a lot of help from Chris Boucher to help clean up his scripts. Unfortunately, I really wish Chris had exercised a little bit more quality control, but apparently he basically took Terry's scripts as soon as he was finished and gave them a polish before going straight to shooting. So their quality is pretty impressive in spite of that. At any rate, let's get into the synopsis of the first episode and see what we're working with. We're introduced to Raj Blake, who lives in the dystopian white hallways of the Federation on Earth. With the help of some friends, he's taken to the outside where he finds out that he was originally a leader of a resistance movement before having his memories erased. Unfortunately, they also led a government agent there who causes a massacre, killing everyone in the building. Blake is the sole survivor and is arrested by the Federation. They know that they can't re-exert their programming to convince him he's just a normal citizen, so come up with a longer term solution. Given a kangaroo trial, fortunately, Blake's lawyer honestly believes that Blake is innocent, and goes digging into trying to find out more information. Blake is, however, sentenced to life on the planet Cygnus Alpha, the space Australia of its day. Along the way, he's introduced to a couple of other prisoners that are likewise being sent to Cygnus Alpha. With any luck, Blake's lawyer will be able to save him and, oh no, he's uh, very, very dead. And Blake is on his way to Sickness Alpha. What will happen next? Find out in episode two. Now, on to the review. For an initial outing, it's not bad. It is a little lacking in tone. It's not quite a courtroom drama like Law and Order, but it's also not really a good dystopian novella like 1984. That being said, Blake's psychoanalyticist has some very interesting comments when trying to reinsert the programming. Reality is a dangerous concept. Each one of us interprets it in a slightly different way. Having followed enough of American politics, I'm aware of the fact that reality is sometimes very subjective. But the extent of the Federation's ability to manipulate the human mind is quite impressive. Blake has spent the last two years firmly convinced that his family are off on the outer colonies. Fact of the matter is, after his failed revolution, they were rounded up and executed. Every video message he was sent from them was really just made to reinforce the programming to convince him he was just a normal citizen. Likewise, we learn from Blake's lawyer that Blake is being charged with being, well, basically Michael Jackson. And the evidence is almost incontrovertible since all of the children that have accused Blake have passed a lie detector test perfectly. However, as we later learn from Blake's lawyer when he goes digging a little bit further, all of the children that have accused Blake were checked out of school two days before the charges were made against Blake, and later the same day admitted to a lead psychiatric hospital where they were given therapy. So the Federation forced these children to have a implanted memory so vivid of these experiences they could pass a 24th century lie detector test. That's how far these people are willing to go as part of their plot to keep Blake from threatening their political power ever again. While at the same time not even bothering to hide all of the bodies from the massacre, since it's outside of the government-controlled biodomes and no one should ever go there to investigate. The Federation is willing to go to any extent to keep their power, while also being so sloppy as to leave 200 corpses to rot in the sun because no one will ever find it. It's almost as if the Federation should really invest in an outside consultant. What exactly should we do about the Blake problem, do you think? First step, clean up all of the dead bodies! They are stinking up the place! Oh my, we had forgotten about those, hadn't we? 
Next step, do not have the spy attend his court case. There is no reason to reveal his identity. Oh, jolly good point. I hadn't really considered that. It would seem like a bit of a weird plot hole to do that when there's no real reason for him to be there. And finally, do not give him a competent lawyer. Give him the office intern who is incapable of adjudicating. Adjudicating! Dalek, get back here. Yes, mistress. I return to your side now. <coughs> Exterminate me. Please. One standout character has got to be Blake's lawyer. He realizes Blake has to be innocent when Blake says he won't deny any of the charges or offer any defense before he finds out what he's being accused of. Only a truly innocent or insane person wouldn't deny those charges. But to the Federation's credit, it's also a brilliant thing to accuse Blake of. Since, as we've seen all too often, just the accusation of something like that is enough to destroy someone's credibility in society even if they're later proven to be innocent. And this is why it's important to have facts, people. The introduction of some of the future mainstays of the series is really quite subdued. We're introduced to Jenna Stannis, badass female space smuggler, and Villa, professional lockpick and coward at heart. I absolutely love this little bit of characterization right here. Easy, take it easy. I hate personal violence, especially when I'm a person. Frankly, a sentiment I think we can all generally get behind. And in some nice world building, we learn from Villa that there's a grading scale used for every civilian in the Federation. Villa's a Delta grade, Blake's an Alpha grade. Now, the grading system's never really explained, but it does get called back on later, and it's a great piece of dystopian shorthand for the series. And Sally Nivette does a great job with her initial role as Jenna, making her into a very interesting and intriguing character. And you'd never believe she quit a theater degree just to pursue this role. So what are some good ways the episode could be improved? In my opinion, I think a little bit more time spent on the courtroom stuff would have been a really good way to establish more of Blake's backstory rather than having a big exposition dump done by his friend back in the hideout. Another thing is rather than give the lawyer a girlfriend for him to bounce ideas off of, instead make her a member of a fellow resistance cell that wants to help prove Blake's innocence. Failing that, maybe a little bit more time spent exploring what it's like living under the heel of the Federation could have been nice, but I recognize that's all just nitpick. For a first episode to get us hooked on the series, it's passable. I don't think it's one that most people would ever find themselves feeling like rewatching, but it is a good and serviceable way to get someone new into the series. I hope you found the review informative, educational, and above all, entertaining. Well, that's it for the first episode. Next, we're going to look at the second episode, Spacefall. What can you expect? Well... We get to watch a man die from shaving cream. We discover that there is another evil William Riker clone in the universe. And we get the coolest spaceship since Serenity, the Liberator. I'll hope to see you then, friends. Until next time.